Welcome to Why Does I Come Before E Except After C. We hope to answer this question or possibly ignore it entirely. We'll see how it goes. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Now, obviously, I have sitting beside me the Comma Queen, known to those who are given the royal imprimatur to do so as Mary Norris. <laughs> Please welcome Mary. Thank you. And I confess, I'm not really royalty. So, you know. Oh, we'll be the judge of that. We like our royalty in Australia, particularly when they visit. Um, we've even got a princess, haven't we, Mary? Isn't she Australian? Yes, at the slip-in. I don't think we should go into that story. Any princess who met a prince at a place called the slip-in. Uh, <laughs> But we're not talking about that today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jane Caro. I will be the, um, this is a word I have trouble saying, but I'm going to try interlocutor for, today, for tonight's session. Now, we've had questions. As you know, um, the Interrobang is all about uh, questions. We've had questions, but for Mary, we've had two. So I'm going to begin with the two questions that have come to me from the ether, from out there. Uh, and it's good that I um, need to say that about the first question because I'm asking a question and I have no idea what it means. So I'm really hoping that Mary does. Uh-oh. <laughs> and the question is, where is the line between linguistic adaptation and appropriation? Linguistic adaptation and appropriation. I didn't understand it, Mary. It's no use looking Who at me. Who asked you to ask that? <laughs> it's written on my sheet. Well, appropriation is always taking something from someone else and doing something different with it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And what was, what was the other thing? Adaptation? Adaptation. Well, that's something that you have to do yourself that comes from you, I think, to make yourself fit into the language. You do something to the language, I think, instead yes. of using something from the language to change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that, that makes sense. So adaptation is you fitting yourself around something. Appropriation is making something else fit around you. Yes. I'm taking something that somebody else has already made and doing something different with it. Yeah. I'm, it would be a very blurry line between them, for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, I think I sort of started to understand the question after hearing your answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that's the hardest one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the one I didn't understand, and I feel deeply relieved that you had trouble with it too. Thank God for that. Now, the next question um, is, a really, is a really interesting one and takes us to, I suppose, the way that communication and language is evolving and the way technology affects that. What implication does the emoji have for the future of linguistics? <laughs> well... I did notice that Oxford Dictionary's word of the year was the emoji for, I, I thought it was laugh until you cry. I don't know, they described it somewhat differently. Um, I prefer words, I, I confess. How very old fashioned of you, Mary. <laughs> and, but an emoji, I believe that's the plural, is just emoji. <laughs> ah. Emoji are for the young, I think. I don't really, I suppose it would be easy enough to find them on my um, Android, but uh, <laughs> I'd hate being ruled by the Android, you know, just because I could find them and it makes it easy and I could poke it. I, you know, I feel that emotion. The laughter you'll cry is kind of a good one for interrobang, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Right? But um, they're going to go ahead without us and they're going to make the language, I think, a little less rich is my my opinion but i'm just an old fogey <laughs> well you know maybe poorer in some ways and richer in another i must admit when anyone sends me anything with an emoji on it i just don't see emojis they just uh, i i disappear them my eyes flick over them uh -huh. um i don't so i'm deeply out of the loop clearly with what's going on with the language if the oxford university dictionary is saying 
it's the word of the year and I don't even see them. There you go. I have emoji blindness. Maybe that's a new condition. Uh, now, those are the only two questions that came in from Mary from the uh, ether. So um, I have prepared a whole lot of questions because I was fortunate enough to spend this week reading Mary's fantastic book, between you and me, Confessions of a Comma Queen, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I became so enamoured, in fact, that I immediately went and looked at your um, YouTube videos where you explain in beautiful, short, pithy YouTube videos a lot of the things that you talk about in the book and sent it to my um, daughter, who's an um, English teacher and a self-confessed and described grammar nerd, she watched them, came straight back to me and said, I love her, I want to be her best friend. <laughs> so uh, that's high praise. Uh, Thank you. You know, she, she regards me as a grammar idiot, which is quite correct. <laughs> so I'm expecting to um, be very much educated by this. But the thing that I loved about your book in particular is that it is, in fact, as much a memoir as a writer's manual. Tell us a bit about why you decided to do it that way. Well, I had thought when I first got the contract for the book, I got the contract for the book on the basis of blogs I wrote, short pieces about peculiarities of New Yorker style, defending the New Yorker comma and the diaresis, which is the two dots above the second O and cooperate, which the New Yorker still uses. It's a little antiquated, but we like it. <laughs> oh, applause for the diaresis. <clears throat> It can look a bit like an emoji, the two dots above the... It looks like a little face, it's yeah, true, yeah, you know. Yeah. Punk. So, <laughs> so I also wrote about pencils because I'm so old-fashioned that I still work with pencil on paper, and I got very attached to soft lead, and it turned out there are also a lot of pencil fanciers out there. Anyway, I thought my idea of the book was that it would be called Pencils and Punctuation, and that it would be one of those language books that you just let flop open and read something about something, you know, oh, here's a bit on hyphens, I'll read that. Um, but my editor said, I'm, I'm not publishing a collection of blog posts. So I had to write something that you could start it from the beginning and read through to the end and use my experiences at the New Yorker and only if they taught something. I couldn't just go on and on about how we each had a nice dictionary with our name in the back and the date, you know. Nobody was interested in the, our, our personal dictionaries. Um, but uh, uh, so the stories about the eccentric people I worked with had to make some point about language, about spelling, about punctuation, about usage. And my personal experience had to come into play in small bits. You know, they gave me the book because they liked, they gave me the contract because they liked me. But when I went ahead and said, well, then you'll like this, then there might have been too much of that. <laughs> so we had to get the right balance throughout the book be uh, between my personal history grammar stuff and New Yorker anecdotes and it had to qualify as a reference book it's called a reference book on yeah. writing and it has bits of memoir so we sometimes call it a refoir a refoir yes what do you mean the language is getting less rich <laughs> there's no emoji for refoir no no I don't think someone will come up with one no doubt at all <laughs> well I was fascinated by the memoir as much as I was by all the things I didn't know about the English language. Um, particularly I loved the strange synchronicity between you starting your working career in a job that I'd never known actually existed but am, am thrilled to discover does. Uh, you began your working life as a foot checker. Please do tell us <laughs> about that. Well, since... I, since the book was published, it turns out there are other cities besides Cleveland that had foot checkers. I was 15 and a half. The job was called Key Girl. And besides cleaning the bathrooms, my job was to sit on a little stool that had this wooden thing attached. Do you have the size sticks at shoe stores in, in yes, Australia? Yes. Well, it's kind of like the bench the shoe salesman sits on and you put your foot up there. But this one, the... the um, stick was a little higher, and when you came into the pool, you had to slosh through this antiseptic fluid, 
Cleveland was pretty polluted. <laughs> And then put one foot at a time up on this um, platform and bend over and spread out your toes. And I would let you pass into the pool after that. And the reason for it was I was supposed to be checking for athlete's foot. And I, I, I never even knew what it looked like, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and that would be athlete's foot with an apostrophe. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So athlete's singular. Athlete. I don't know. Uh oh. We'll have to look in the dictionary. I've stumped her. <laughs> um, well, the, but the interesting thing is, in a weird kind of way, how you began is how you have gone on. <laughs> because you are spreading prose now and examining it. It's, I hadn't thought of it in those exact terms. When we were looking for some way to publicize the book, something short and pithy. Somebody said, too bad you weren't a fact checker. Because then we could say from foot checker to fact checker. And then I had the idea, well, we could go from toes to prose. But see, they didn't use see, that either. That's why you're writing the book. <laughs> but it, it is true. There is a strange parallel between rooting out the evil elements in things, right? <laughs> and putting My, them through an antiseptic bath. Oh. And having them clean and beautiful <laughs> at the end. And then you get to go swimming. Yeah. In wonderful, wonderful words and writing. And the, thing, the interesting thing for me as a, 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 an Australian, and we follow English spelling here, is your conversation about the differences between American spelling and usage and English spelling and usage. And I didn't know that this all came from Webster. Who, who was the original, um, who wrote the original Webster's Dictionaries. I had no idea about that, that that was where it came from. Yes, I did quite a lot of research on Noah Webster, and he was one of the American patriots. He met George Washington, he got advice from Benjamin Franklin, pretty terrible advice from Benjamin Franklin, and uh, his contribution to the American Revolution was to revolutionize, revolutionize American spelling. Um, it may sound absurd, but um, he wanted us to have our own brand of English. And he, he, had, he had a few. We did it on purpose. We took the U out of color, you know, C-L-O-U-R, and um, we changed Z. We call it Z. Mm -hmm. That was Noah Webster mm -hmm. who came up with that. He had a lot of other crazy ideas. He wanted to call Y. Ye, I can hardly even say it. Ye, um, X Y Z, <laughs> and um, what else did he do? He had racket, R A C Q U E T. No, racket, C K. He wanted to regularize things. He hated the silent E. Um, a word like soup. He wanted to spell differently, and he he. he let, he, he would take the E's off of things. Like no more. Yes, and he'd put them in the dictionary and people would say, well, it, you know, people would use it anyway. Mm. But to know Webster's credit, if people did it anyway, he said, well, I, I have to let them have that. Mm. Usage always wins in the end. You can't force things on people. Well, you do realise that he's driven the rest of the English-speaking world completely mad ever since with spell check. On, uh, and, uh, on computers, which is constantly criticising you for keeping the English spelling and not moving to the American spelling. Really? Yes, you get a, you get a red line if you write C-O-L-O-U-R. The tyranny of the internet. Of I'm no Webster. <laughs> he goes on into the world. The other thing is, you are what is an American called a uh, sub-editor, is that correct? Oh no, that's copy in Britain. That's yeah, you're called, called a copy editor. So, sorry, here and in England we call them sub editors. And one of the things that's been happening, certainly in Australia, is basically the death of the sub editor. They are being shed uh, furiously from publications. Is this something that is also happening in America? And why is it happening? And What's it going to lead to? Well, it's happening. So many things have economic reasons. Mm. And, of course, it's happening because um, print is struggling to, to compete with electronic uh, media. And um, it'll survive. I, I believe it will survive. Um, 
But meanwhile, one of the things that they cut is the copy department. It has not happened at the New Yorker. I believe it's happened at a lot of newspapers, and I suppose it does show. Um, at the New Yorker, we've actually we actually have a separate copy department for the electronic for the um, website, and they're young, but they really they're really keen to enforce grammar. It's really it's really cute. <laughs> Well, that's really encouraging because I think, uh, you know, the universality of access that the internet provides, which is a wonderful thing in many ways, is also um, brings with it a cost. And the cost of that is often a kind of complete free-for-all in terms of the way people write, the rules have gone out the window. Uh, I got a, a, a tweet this morning when someone knew I was doing this saying, what is it? with the desire to capitalise everything. And there's a lot of that um, on the internet where people are, you know, sticking capitals at one of the same fields on random words all over the place. I mean, so it's great to hear that there is a bunch of young people in an office putting a metaphorical or a cyberspace red line through things mm -hmm. and holding on to um, some sort of correct usage. But then again, why does correct usage matter? I mean... No, you said, no, Webster had a, more, had a kind of, well, if they want it, let them have it. But why does grammar matter? Why does where the comma go matters? Why does, um, you know, correct usage? What's, what's, what's the point of it, really? What's the point of all these rules? Oh, don't put me on the spot or anything. Uh, <laughs> now, I think um, that we, we care about it. Uh, you know, every time you open your mouth, you make an impression on people. And every time you write something, you make an impression on people. And uh, it tells so much about you, the kind of words you use, and whether you care enough to learn where a comma goes. Um, and I don't mean to intimidate anyone, because I basically... I have your glasses when you say that to me. <laughs> you, can f <laughs> you can follow your ear. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it's, it's, it's like the, the Italian bella figura. You just want to make a good impression. You want to look the best you can, in, especially in print. I think when something is online, there, the standards are a little looser, but print is still, a, to me, a permanent thing. Mm. It's, it's not exactly carved in stone, but it, <laughs> it's as close as we get these days. And so you just want to have some pride in it. Mm. And do do the best you can. So it's a it's 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 in a way a form of respect to the language. I think so. I think a lot of the, the arguments, debates about usage, people ask why really does it matter? Why does the New Yorker continue to use the diuresis and to con and continue to follow certain rules of language? And it's because we have respect for the past. Mm. It's to keep our link with the people who have used the language before us, the thing that we've inherited, it's tradition. And of course some of it is going to be shed along the way, but that doesn't mean we have to pitch it out ahead of time. You know, it'll go, but we have to take care of it the best we can as long as we still have it, I think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And things do change. I mean, I was fascinated to realise that, for example, Shakespeare uses the word presently to mean now. We use the word presently to mean almost the exact opposite, in a while. Soon, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So lang words can actually completely switch in meaning as, as they age, I suppose. Well, I didn't know that that was Shakespeare's use that mm. meant now because that's a, a mistake that we, we see sometimes. We change presently. When people mean currently, they, they write presently and we have to change that mm. to currently or now. Yes, yes. <laughs> now is nicer, I think. <laughs> but there you go. I do like a simple word. Um, the other... I, I mean, there are, there are common problems that people have and I have to confess, I have a lot of these problems. Um, that versus which, for example. I constantly get tripped up uh, and, and it's not helped by the fact that my grammar tools underline them, it seems to me, at random. Whichever <laughs> one I choose, it tells me it's wrong. Um, I, I, I can't get a grasp on when it's that and when it's which. 
This is one of the hardest things to explain in three minutes or less. <laughs> Basically, I can give you two sentences that um, the writer Roger Angel told me E.B. White came up with to shorten his trials because you know he was the co-author of Elements of Style, which is a little book that's an American Bible of usage. And the uh, explanation is, at least in America, we don't try to tell anyone else what to do, okay? Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> we do, don't we? <laughs> You're, I stand corrected. Um, we use that when we are introducing a restrictive element. That's something that is defining and that the sentence wouldn't make any sense without. And we use which with a comma before it if we're using something, if we're adding something non-restrictive, something that's, that describes So in a way, which is, is expanding. So it, which, right. mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. will make the engine run is a way of something explaining like something. Right. Uh, and... But it, it's, it's very... Um, subjective. It right. really is subjective. The sentences that E.B. White used were, uh, the New Yorker is a magazine that likes which. <laughs> <laughs> and I've already screwed it up. What he said was, the New Yorker is the magazine that likes which. The other sentence was, the New Yorker is a magazine, comma, which likes that. <laughs> but see, lovely. I did screw it up. So I don't expect you to take that away from here <laughs> in any coherent form. But you can, it's very confusing. Somebody asked me, um, well, would you use that or which if you said, say, I bought shoes that were too small. And I said, why would you do that? <laughs> Vanity, <laughs> usually. <laughs> okay, Cinderella. All right. <laughs> well, Talking about it's confusing and it's quite difficult. I mean, you write um, with great openness and honesty about the joy of catching a mistake yes. uh, and, and, and what pleasure you take in that, <laughs> um, which I, I actually really enjoyed. And in fact, you, you, you write about how um, Philip Roth proposed marriage to you because you found a mistake. He only asked me to live with him. He did oh, not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, from what we know of Philip Roth, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> so I hear he has a nice pool. <laughs> you could have checked his feet. Um, but you also write, and this is what is so wonderful about this book, is you write about the joy of catching a mistake, but you also write about the despair in making one. Yes. Um, my first mistake that got into the New Yorker was the word... Chaise lounge. Oh, That's how we yes. said it in Ohio. <laughs> Chaise long it is. It's a long chair, not a lounge chair. So I found that out the hard way. Um, the woman who I was taught, trained by, sent a memo around the office. Somebody had written in, uh, you know, readers are always writing and pointing out our mistakes, and uh, you know, she had clipped this from the magazine, the Chez Long, that had my thumbprint all over it, and I wrote a little note that said, are the glory days of the New Yorker gone forever? <laughs> Ouch. Yes, and the boss circulated that with a little addition in her handwriting, they certainly are. So it could be so humiliating. It still is. It's very humiliating to make a mistake. I made one, an, another one recently. Um, let's see, what was the word? Somebody wrote um, bullion, and I thought it meant bullion, the gold, and he really, it was in a sentence about soup even. <laughs> but I thought it was a sentence, yeah, you know, I thought he meant a soup with a thread of gold, and I don't know what. No. But that one is completely my mistake. And what happens is you feel wretched, but you go home and, you know, you have your evening, you go to sleep, and the next day it's not so bad. It turns out it's not the end of the world. <laughs> I, I, I so identified with you writing about how you would literally lie awake and, you know, berate yourself and feel, you know, wretched, as you say. I think every writer has had those lie awakes and beat yourself up about something you've written or something you failed to write, or something you got wrong or whatever. And you're right, the next day when the sun comes up, you think, oh, well, I stuffed up. 
yet in again. In the great scheme of things, you know, Boyan, Boyan. <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce it. Chaise Long. Boy. Yeah, well, that one I should have gotten Chaise right. Long, I think that's quite good. Um, and I, there is an interesting thing I was thinking as I was reading your book about words that get invented. I mean, emoji is, I guess, a, a newly invented word. Um, but also, Australians have invented a new collective noun. And I wondered if the collective noun use, <laughs> use, the plural of you. Oh, use. use. Y-O-U-S-E. Use. <laughs> oh, use are all so nice to come here today. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Used correctly. Irish do that too, and certain people from Newark, New Jersey. Awesome. Oh, it's good. Yes. And, but I wondered, is it the Australian equivalent of y'all? The ah, y'all, the southern is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it mean the same thing? Like all of you use y'all. Hmm. <laughs> I, I'm not convinced. Okay. <laughs> I think you all has that nice drawl, you know. Yeah, use. use. <laughs> Said in an Aussie accent is so attractive. Oh, I love it when you put those accents on. I love it. I'm trying to. I have a question for you. How do you pronounce C A I R N S? Cairns. 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 Up in the back of the nose, Mary. Cairns. Cairns. No S on the end. Okay, Cairns. All right. Oh, there is a little bit of an S, but it's a hint of an S. It's a hint. <laughs> A mere soup song of an S. Kids. That's it with a look. That's it. That better? <laughs> and it's not Brisbane. I knew that. I knew that. It's Brisbane. <laughs> and it's not... It's Melbourne. 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 I, I am from Ohio. I say I'm on burn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm heavy on the R's. And now... This is a question that has been keeping English speakers up at night for years and years, and that is the pronoun problem. Ah. The singular there. Yeah. Yes. The no collective word for non-gendered yes. he, she, they, their. How do we deal with this, Mary? Help us. Well, we have various ways. You, you know what we're talking about, right? The, the lack of the word he, sh. We need something that means both he and she in order to preserve the concept of number in grammar. For instance, um, uh, the flight attendant might say, I hope everyone reaches their home and safely. And, you, you know, a grammarian hears everyone. doesn't take their home. You have to say her home, or she should have just said, I hope you all get home okay, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it was Delta, they fly yeah. out of Atlanta. So, <laughs> the, the problem with it is, is the English language is deficient, it doesn't have what they call the epicene pronoun, the one that does not have gender, so the, we have various solutions. Um, you could say he or she, him or her, which is a little... Um, it's clumsy, isn't clumsy. it? It's mm. not always the best thing. It, it adds a lot of words. It's always nicer to keep things concise if you can. The time-honored uh, solution has just been to use the masculine pronoun. And feminism has... We just can't do that anymore. And you could alternate. You could sometimes use him, sometimes use her. Mixes people up a little. But the, the, the solution, the people's solution, the one Webster is going to have to bend to eventually, is to use their and call it singular. Mm. It's like, it happened with you. You used to have thou, and that, that was the singular form, and you was the plural, and they combined, and the, that's probably going to happen with they and there. In the meantime, I, it's kind of fun to play with it. I know some male writers who occasionally will use the feminine pronoun when um, they're talking about somebody of non-specific gender, so we're getting a little bit, I, it's, at least it's in the air. Yes. Um, but more and more, actually, you know, people who are authorities are calling it the singular there and saying it's okay. It still jumps out at me. Another thing, if you're writing, the other solution is just to recast the sentence. Just think of some other way of saying it. Instead of everyone t t took his seat, you just say, 
everyone sat down. You mm. just <laughs> eliminate the problem entirely. Yeah, take the pronoun out. Yes. But I do think you're right that they and there is going to... It, you can see the direction in which it's heading. And I, I have noticed particularly um, some academics, if they're writing about, say, um, uh, bringing up children or, or child psychology, they will say she in one academic paper and he in another so that they're sort of um, being as um, inclusive as possible. Which is interesting, but it's still the she stands out a bit. It's nice. I like it. I think, oh, I'm included. But um, <laughs> the problem is, a, is, a, is it's itchy. Yes, and if it's academic, it's not going to enter the popular no. Oh, no. vocabulary. You know? no, that's true. We reject it. <laughs> now, you said that, and I thought this was particularly interesting, and I wondered if you'd written it because you knew you were coming to this festival, and then I thought, no, that couldn't possibly be true. This must just be a really interesting kind of ser serendipity. You said that the Interrobang was invented by 60s ad men. Tell yes. us about that. And tell us what an Interrobang is, because there's probably a few people here, you're at a festival called that, no bloody idea what it is. <laughs> oh, you know what it is. The Interrobang was invented by an ad man, and... It the combination of the question mark and the exclamation point when you can't decide when you want both. There should probably be an emoji for this, right? The, maybe the laugh to weep. But it's for some, when you say, for instance, what the hell? You know, what the hell is formally a question, but it's also an exclamation. exclamation. Yeah. And I was taught by this same woman who was so critical of my spelling of Chase Lount, <laughs> that whichever punctuation mark is the stronger should win that you know because we you cannot it, the interrobang did not catch on so well that they put it on the typewriter you could make it with a typewriter by backspacing you know putting question mark backspacing and then the uh, exclamation point but you know, nobody put it in the fonts that are available on um online, so we, we can't even make it, and we can't, for some reason we don't ever at the New Yorker use two points, we can't make the exclamation point and the question mark, we would never decide, be able to decide which came first, and we would keep, you know, <laughs> over and over, so the exclamation point is the one that triumphs, if, if you want, that's what you want, we call them screamers, yeah. and we try not to use them too much. I actually had a column in my high school newspaper called Interrobang About. <laughs> the first year it was called Intrabang because we got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Intero is in interrogative and bang is the same as screamer. Yeah. And it has not caught on. Um, no, well, I'm is this is the first use of it in Australia? Maybe yeah. you can do that. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, I used to teach... Um, I have to... Uh, 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 a subject at the University of Western Sydney of the most intense academic rigour. It was uh, advertising creative. <laughs> and um, the, I used to be quite kind of um, firm about certain things that they could and couldn't use in writing copy. One was no exclamation marks. I just banned them completely. Um, somebody, somebody almost to a quad, right? <laughs> yes. Three I, in a lifetime. Yes. <laughs> I banned them completely. Three dots. You know the three dots? Dot, dot, dot. Ellipsis, and I, yes. Which I really, really hate, and rhetorical questions. I banned all three. They weren't allowed to use them for any reason at all. And my reasoning was that all three of them try to lead the witness. It's lazy writing. You're trying to... Instead of, instead of writing it well enough so that people get your meaning through the words that you choose, you're trying to use those... Pre emojis, is that what they might be? Um, proto emojis to um, to force the reader to, to, into a particular state of mind. Is that fair enough for punctuation to do that, or was I right, or was I cruel? Oh, a little of each. Yeah, um, I think it would be cruel to ban the rhetorical question because you know that's. Well, in Such advertising, an easy entry. Right? In advertising, they always say things like, like all the kids would start their copy with. Looking for a, an overseas holiday? And I say, the obvious answer to that is no. <laughs> Leave me alone. What I was against, um, there was a little contest going on at the New Yorker at some point for a new punctuation mark. They always want a 
something that will indicate irony, you know, because especially online, yeah, it's hard to an email. You know, you can be saying something that's perfectly flat, and somebody thinks it's ironic or nasty, and so. We have not come up with anything for irony. You just should get your words in the right order. Mm. And maybe you could use italics to stress something if you had to. But somebody wanted to use the squiggle thing, you know, the, the tilde or the unequals mark, whatever it is. Put that at the very beginning of a sentence to indicate that I could have done this better, but I don't have time. <laughs> you know? I was so against that, you know. Just do it better. <laughs> I always thought that about the three dots. It's trying to make you read on instead of actually writing something that is interesting enough that you want to read on. Yes. So, yes, I was a bit of a Nazi Three dots, myself. we were against. That's another thing I learned early on. We don't, at the New Yorker, trail off unless it's in conversation. We just end. <laughs> and even to show if we quote something... You know, three dots are a legitimate use of uh, oh, yeah. show omitted material yeah. in, quote, quote, in quoted matter. But if you sometimes people want to show that it goes on after they're finished quoting, and you don't have to do that, just end it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you see, I'm completely contradictory because I don't like three dots. I don't like screamers, but I love a dash. I will put dashes <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> It's a very feminine punctuation mark. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Why is it a very feminine punctuation mark? Women are famous for dashes, especially in letters. You know, it's a, a, a 19th century epistolary thing. Um, a lot of women feel, you know, that's all you need to know. Whenever you feel a pause, put in a dash. That's I think that may be my solution to the comma problem. I just put in a dash. <laughs> it has a little bit of a breathy, excited effect. But it's also, it's so versatile, the dash. You can use it for a comma. You can use it for, a, you know, a pause. Or a, you can use it at the end. You can use it at the beginning to indicate a change of speaker. It has many, many uses. Instead of parenthesis and brackets. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I, I th look, it solved a lot of my problems, the dash. Um, and you talk, you, you speak very interestingly about the way very different writers have used the dash. Dickens, for example, was a fan of the dash, but used it in a particularly idiosyncratic way. Yes, he used it with, in combination with, with other marks. We call it the com dash and the semi dash. He, I, I, you can even see what he's trying to do when he's doing it. He even uses a double dash. And that means that somebody is punching someone, usually. It's, <laughs> it's just such fury that somebody breaks off talking, and there's violence. And that's what he uses that second dash for. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a kind of exciting punctuation, Mark. The dash. It has dash. The oh, dash. yes. Yes. Dashing. It's dashing. And, and Emily Dickinson also is a, is, 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 uses the dash in the most extraordinary ways. She's infuriating. <laughs> It's just that um, I had to copy edit some Emily Dickinson once that was quoted, and it came. To, I went and looked at the source, and they weren't full length dashes. They were what a full length dash is called a one M dash. It's the width of the capital letter M. Emily Dickinson's dashes were one N. They were shorter, the width of a capital letter N. And at the New Yorker, we we don't spa we don't leave space between dashes and the material before it. And she left lots of space, <laughs> and she put them all over the place, as everybody knows. So when I was doing research for dashes on the book, I tried I used Emily Dickinson, and she used them for all different kinds of reasons, and not necessarily the usual grammatical reason. And the editor who took, who made the decision of what size dash to use in the complete poems of Emily Dickinson, ended up using a hyphen, which is the mark that we just use. It has no character at all. It's, so he, you know, he completely stripped all that. He took the content out of the dash, and he used instead a hyphen with spaces around it. He called it a spaced hyphen, because that's what he thought um, represented her various uses best, that you just had to interpret them yourself. So what that reveals is that a really good copy editor in fact thinks very hard 
about the intent of the writer when it comes to what you will accept and what you won't accept. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, that is something that I have to judge constantly because it's not my writing. There's somebody else's name on it. And I often try to have my way with it, but um, it is the writer's work. And there, there's a writer, I don't know if you know, the writer Richard Ford. Oh, yes. Who is, he's from the South, but he knew he wasn't as good as Faulkner or Eudora Welty, so he moved to Michigan. <laughs> I'll get my material up north. And, and he moved to New Jersey. And I once tried to take a comma out of a piece of his. He uses, and I found out later, I actually heard him, he, it's a, he refers to it in one of his books, the comma after so. You know, that's so. Let's talk about Richard Ford. Um, it has an effect. It's an effective comma. But in a lot of constructions it can be done without and I, I tried to take it out and he was very stubborn and he had to put it back in and I didn't like that about him for a while and then I met him and he t- turns out he's dyslexic and he takes a long time to read so imagine how long it takes him to write each word is like three dimensional for him mm-hmm. and if he puts a comma in he needs to have that comma in so mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we came to terms <laughs> he so did not Proposition me, but <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, there was something special. Um, so that leads me to ask you, what on earth was it like for the poor copy editor for your own book? How was that for them? I can imagine you're going to copy edit Mary Norris's book. Great! And how was that for you? Well, originally, my publisher asked if I wanted to have the book um, copy edited in New Yorker style or in the style of the house style of W.W. W. Norton. And I thought, well, New Yorker style, that's what I'm used to. And then I thought again and I realized that when people come, writers for the New Yorker complain about New Yorker style, I always think, you're getting published by the New Yorker. Mm. Shut up. <laughs> mm. And I didn't want to be the kind of person that would have, you'd have to say that to Ed Norton. You know, I wanted to be amenable. So the copy editor who was willing to do New Yorker style, she, it turned out somebody had volunteered to do it and then she couldn't for family reasons. So they hired it out just like any other book. And the copy editor it fell to his name was Otto Sontag. You know. <laughs> and he did a very... He, you know, he did his best with it, but he had his own tics. And uh, for instance, I found I found out that I didn't know the difference between if and whether, and he did. That's one of the things he knew, and so he changed all my weathers to ifs. And I tried to go along with it, uh, but I didn't like it in the end. And I, then I and New Yorker spelling, of course, we couldn't use the double L in marvelous. But I was able to rewrite that and put in a little with the New Yorker double L. You know, I was able to get away with that one. And there were a few others that I snuck back in after first accepting them. <coughs> <laughs> but then what happened was that an excerpt from it ran in the New Yorker. So oh. the New Yorker copy editor <laughs> had to copy edit it. And they were all terrified, <coughs> which was really too bad because mistakes snuck in because everyone was so scared to... There is one paragraph that, and I did this on purpose, or at least I, it came naturally to do it. I had a split infinitive, and I ended a sentence with a preposition, and I don't think I misspelled anything. Um, there, there is one usage in the book that comes up all the time. I get all these letters, your book is really good, but on page 72, you wrote, D was two years younger than me, and this really just destroyed people because they had learned that than is a conjunction and is to be followed by a full clause. Should have, I should have written, D was two years younger than I with the understood M. And I, I've gotten so many letters about it that I went back and thought, well, maybe I should just change it to I, <laughs> turn off the faucet on these letters. But it is what came naturally to me. Than can be a preposition. It can take me. A lot of people learned in third grade that it couldn't, but it can. And, and also, how do we know that? 
Like, you see it written in my book. Oh, okay. <laughs> First <clears throat> right answer. <clears throat> well, no, no, no. I think no, you, you know what? The, one of the last points I wanted to make was that this passage, this sentence introduced a very intimate section of the book. And for somebody to balk at that, <laughs> when I'm about to like pour out my heart, that's not when you correct someone. So that, you know? <laughs> so that is actually obsessing about the wrong thing. It's obsessing about um, a, a detail and missing the emotional truth yes. of what then follows. And exactly. that is something else that needs to always be taken into account when you're looking at somebody's expression, their exactly. writing and communication. Yes. Thank you so much. We now have 15 minutes for you guys to ask Mary questions. Hi, Jane. Hi, Mary. How are you? Um, thank you for a, a lovely event this evening. I've actually got two questions. Sorry to be cheeky. Um, the first is, was Webster responsible for the Oxford comma? And the second is, who were you most intimidated by when editing? Sorry, what was the last? Who was the most intimidating uh, we, writer I yes. ever edited? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Hmm. Well, I feel very strongly about the Oxford comma. We call it the serial comma in America. We <laughs> um, <clears throat> should call it the New Yorker comma. <clears throat> Just because it's, it works for me and the people who take it out are doing that also for economic reasons. Those are the same people that are firing copy editors. <laughs> um, I don't know whether Webster himself would have approved of it or not. I think he would have. He had a very crude way of defining the prep, um, punctuation. Comma was one beat, semicolon was two beats, colon was three beats, period was four beats. <laughs> that was all there was to it. And the most intimidating writer I ever edited, um, probably Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell is very slick and um, he's very good. And my pencil just slides off of him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's like it's there's it has it Teflon, right? There's just nothing I could do to improve it, and um, I just do my best to understand it and stay out of the way. So, next question. Um, my name is Caddy. I'm an editor, uh, copy editor, possibly you'd call it here. I in Australia, I'm not sure if it's the same in the states. Uh, in the prof profession of editing, ninety percent of editors are women. I have made it my mission in over 20 years of editing to uh, make the language as non-gender specific as possible. <laughs> so I change uh, gender specific terms to their non-gender specific equivalent wherever I can. Do you think uh, the fact that so many women are in the profession and hopefully a lot of them identify as feminists and do what I do is gradually changing the language? Well, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I think... I, there are a lot of women. The people who taught me were both women. Um, there are two figureheads at the New Yorker, were Eleanor Gould and Lou Burke, but they were of a different generation, and they would have said, oh, that's all nonsense, and used the masculine. Um, but it is changing, and I don't know how much influence copy editors will have, as women copy editors will have. I just don't know. Um, I hope a lot. And I hope we do the right thing. Um, I don't know what more I can say. Um, except that there should also be men copy editors. Yes. Yes. And also it's an interesting question, Does do speakers and writers drive the language or do copy editors drive, like, you oh, know... Speakers and writers, we yeah. don't drive it. Yeah. We just... <laughs> What do you we slow do? it down. We pull it over and say, I'm sorry, Roddy, you were speaking. That's right. We're, we're fucking backseat drivers. That's what we are. I've been wanting to use that word. Yeah. She uses it to great effect in the book. There's a wonderful moment where Mary writes that uh, when Scarlett O'Hara says, fiddle dee dee, she really means, oh, what was it? Fuck this shit. shit fuck this shit. <laughs> You see, if you made Gone with the Wind now, Scarlett O'Hara would say, fuck this shit. <laughs> do, we have a, 
<laughs> Do we have another question? Yes. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, since you'd been, been doing editing for such a long time, what was it like to shift to writing and how did the skills transfer? Um, sorry, I didn't quite get that. What about something about... I was just wondering, um, seeing as you've, you've spent a long time editing and you know what it's like to be on that side of the page, so to speak, yes. what's it like to be writing instead and to putting your own words out there uh, okay. rather than working with other people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for a while at The New Yorker, I was doing both. I was, doing, um, I was trying to write talk stories, little pieces for the magazine, at the same time that I was on the copy desk. So I'd have the experience of having to worry about whether my piece would be accepted, and then if it was, I had a copy edited. Which, <laughs> <laughs> which, well, actually, it was really educational because at that time, William Sean was the editor, and I would see his edits, and I thought, oh, he was a genius. He would take out a sentence, and that piece would close up behind it seamlessly. It was beautiful. But then, then I had, the, <laughs> on the weeks when my story wasn't accepted, I had to copy edit the people whose stories were accepted. <laughs> and, oh, I had, I had to beat down the envy so bad, you know, to be professional about it. And it was really kind of remarkable. As a writer, I wanted it all my way. I didn't want anyone touching anything. <laughs> and as a copy editor, I was all over them. <laughs> so, But that was when I was younger, and I really think I've mellowed quite a bit. I was really eager to be edited, grateful to be edited, and I learned so much from having worked as a copy editor for so long. I'm really detail-oriented, and that's, and I add, even, you know, I mean, I'm detail-oriented about the little things, the punctuation mm. marks, but also I like to add descriptive detail and take little detours and things. So I had this great editor who kept trying to tell me, what did he say? Throw the sharp, throw one sharp dart. That's what he said, you know. Just go from Cleveland to Chicago and leave out the detours to Toronto and Cincinnati, you know. Um, and he fortunately had the big picture. I could, you know, I didn't know how to make a chapter. I didn't know how to form something that both ended and led to something else. And he was able, he had, he's the one who had the big picture, macro and micro. Um, so it's a forest for the trees sort of thing, and it was an occupational hazard. And I hope I learned, but I think I just really need a good editor, and I'm happy to have one. <laughs> <laughs> is there another question? Yep. Hi, um, my name is Liz, and my question is about um, the use of the apostrophe, because so many people I've found, and, and I think it's more maybe a younger generation thing, or people not appreciating the difference between an apostrophe for the contraction as opposed to the possessive form. And I wondered whether you had any views on, you know, in terms of how people are using more, I guess, online um, writing, and they just don't seem to notice the difference between, you know, Peter's pen as opposed to, you know, using, I guess, the apostrophe as a um, contraction? Well, the contraction is a pretty uh, easy use of the apostrophe. It shouldn't be that hard. Some people might get it in the wrong place, and the word doesn't say. They might, but um, it turns out that the possessive apostrophe is actually more difficult. You know, we, we many of us learned it's, uh, you form a plural by adding an apostrophe S. I'm sorry, you see, I've screwed it up already. You form the possessive of a noun by adding an apostrophe and an S. If the word ends in S, then you still, if, to be safe, just still add an apostrophe and an S if it's a singular. If it's a plural, then you just add the apostrophe. The trouble is that S is overused in the English language. You know, it, it's made to work as both a plural and a possessive, and that's when we get into trouble. Um, and then, the, you know, some of them just don't sound very nice. Dickenses. Um, we may, and the, it's funny that we, the ones we make exceptions for are the Greeks, Socrates. We wouldn't dare go with Socrateses, um, and Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus repels the S. He takes the apostrophe, but not the S. Um, the one, the real problem out. is that people then, what, what Lynn Trust, the Eat, Shoots, and Leaves Lady, she calls it the grocer's apostrophe. When, you know, carrot 
apostrophe S. <laughs> Carrots on sale. Um, One of them lived. <laughs> that's somebody who thinks it's fancy to put in the apostrophe and worries that if, if he doesn't, um, he'll... I don't know, something wrong, will be wrong with the sign. Should just all make it just one big carrot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or a lettuce. Look, it's not just younger generation. I am here to make a shameful confession. <laughs> I just put a, I either put apostrophes on everything or nothing. I go from one extreme to the other. I have a very patient friend who quietly says to me, It's a lovely piece, Jane, but here's all your wrong apostrophes. <laughs> Which is really sweet of her, because otherwise I'd look like an idiot, <laughs> worse than I do now. Um, so I think it's just, yeah, I have problems with it. You comfort me by saying that it is actually quite complicated. Well, one of the things that's also happened is that on f telephones, you have to switch the screens to get an apostrophe. Yes. And that's a, t a pain. pain. I mean, <laughs> I still do it, but I wish. You have to, Mary. <laughs> I'm Good Lord, imagine stuck. getting a text from Mary <laughs> with no apostrophe and a possessive. <laughs> Is there another question? We have time for a couple more. Hi, um, I was just wondering how New Yorker style has kind of developed since you started. Like, you, obviously they still put the little thing over the corporate, but have other things changed since you started? Well, <clears throat> people ask me that a lot. <clears throat> and it's hard for me to defend certain things in New Yorker style because I didn't invent them. And it's kind of lost to time who did. I can tell you that the style book of the New Yorker, it's a big, black, heavy thing. It's just a list of words, but it was clearly compiled by somebody who came home from the Second World War and said, we have to codify this operation. You know, it has a lot about bombing squads in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, whether to so capitalize... So it's a manual or... of post-traumatic stress disorder as well yes, as... Yeah. Yes, But things do change, and the way they change is that it's usually an editor who just all of a sudden can't stand it anymore. <laughs> we had the... We used to spell the word intern with an E on the end, and just before the Monica Lewinsky episode, we took that E off, thank God. God, we would have looked so foolish. An intern with an E on the end is somebody who's been an internee in a camp, I, I would say, but that was, would not describe Monica. The word, the word deluxe we used to spell as two words, very fancy. Deluxe, you know. So, and some editor just came, you know. She, all, it, you could almost picture her coming in with a sword. You know, I'm tired of this thing, you know. And overnight... We changed style on Deluxe and closed it up. And I think it's a little bit poor for it. Del deluxe was so much more Deluxe than delu deluxe. deluxe is like a ham hamburger at a diner, you know. Mm. It comes with French fries. That's so right. Deluxe is something that's padded, you know. So, <laughs> so we've lost that. Um, I can tell you, in case you're tempted, we do not change things because readers write in about them. <laughs> We have two minutes left. Do we have one last question? Thank you. I was lucky enough to study editing when I went to university and it felt like coming home. It was absolutely eye-opening and thrilling. And I remember one time when we started talking about uh, the diagramming of sentences, it was the science I'd never seen before. And maybe we'll have to tell you what that is later, Jane. But everything has a place, you know? Everything in a sentence has a reason for being. And I went up to the tutor afterwards wide-eyed and said, this is exciting and amazing, why were we never taught this? And he was Texan and he said to me that in Australia and New Zealand, where I grew up, grammar basically stopped being taught at that level and the kind of information that we needed to know how to construct good English stopped being taught in the 1970s. So now that I'm a mother and I've got children and I try very hard not to edit everything they do, do you have advice for how we look at language with the youngsters coming into our lives and how it is that we can help them be informed about good, good usage if it's not happening outside of our homes? Well, I don't think that necessarily will um, involve a return to diagramming sentences, I'm sorry to say. I learned to diagram sentences. We didn't do it for very long. And the way that I learned grammar was by studying German. <laughs> I think, you know, broaden them give them Latin. I didn't have Latin, but I think you really, you know, the speech is just going to gush out of people. 
and and writing, we hope, will just gush out of people. And if you read, you see better ways to do things. So read, 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 read. And study a foreign language. Because it, you learn the names for things and how those foreign languages work. And in order to understand those, you have to see how your own language works to have a point of comparison. So I learned everything I know from the German one. <laughs> <coughs> and with my English teacher daughter, there is some encouraging signs that grammar is coming back. <laughs> That's it then. We have run out of time, unfortunately, um, which is such a shame because I have learnt more in the last hour from the comma queen uh, than I can remember. <laughs> yes, I, oh, she's got an orb and a scepter, the whole lot. Uh, <laughs> I, I simply want to say to you, Mary, thank you so much for everything you've said here tonight, but also thank you for your book and thank you for your wonderful YouTube videos. I am now going to go whenever I'm standing, sitting there going, that witch, should there be a posture? I'm just going to look, I'm just going to get you up there in front of me and you are going to tell me and I am eternally grateful for that. Can uh, we all please thank Mary Norris? Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here, really.